So I'm Dr. Mati Centeno, Professor of Political Science. I am very proud to introduce Sean uh, Irisi, who will be graduating in May, much to my chagrin. Um, I've had the really a good, the good fortune to see Sean develop from, uh, you know, not only academically, but uh, as a person as well. It's been a real pleasure. Um, I did not honestly want to sign his graduation paper. <laughs> Um, Sean is presenting his senior seminar thesis, um, and the topic of the senior seminar, uh, which is a capstone course in hats, was revolution. And he chose a topic that no one had ever done before in my class. I get a lot of French Revolution, the you know, Mexican Revolution. But this was a new topic, and so I'm really proud of that uh, as well. And he really worked hard on it. He was really freaking out at the beginning of the semester. Don't freak out. It'll happen. And it did. So, I give you Sean Arisi. Thank you so much, Dr. C, uh, for that introduction. Um, again, I'm Sean Racy. I'm majoring in political science, and it's my last semester here at Adams. Um, so um, throughout history, there have been a variety of revolutions and movements uh, that have impacted uh, political, economic, and social institutions within various societies. Um, and revolution not only affects a, a, a particular area, uh, that is experiencing a revolution, but the spread of ideas and philosophy um, contribute to a revolution as a whole. Um, so when we look at these various movements and revolutions, uh, we often look at, a, scholars look at a specific variable of a revolution to give us a deeper understanding about why a revolution occurs or allow us to have a better understanding of um, the context of the revolution. And so um, one particular um, variable that is often overlooked in scholarly work until very recently is women and their roles in revolutions and movements. So I wanted to focus on, um, so when coming up with this topic, I really wanted to focus on uh, women in a particular revolution, and I picked the Islamic, um, well, the 1979 Islamic Iranian Revolution, um, which is the, a conservative revolution, the most well-known conservative revolution, and one of the few conservative revolutions. And so my thesis is in 1970 Iran, uh, the Iranian revolution had major and lasting impacts on societal roles and social status of women in Iranian society. This research will investigate the role that female activists and organizations played in trying to maintain or advance civil liberties and human rights during the Iranian revolution and the lasting impact the revolution had on the daily lives of women. In undertaking this project, I have investigated the impact that the Iranian that Iranian women had on the Iranian Revolution as a whole in society. So, quick disclaimer: so there are a couple of epistemological issues uh, that arose for me. One of which is my own personal experiences and life stories have shaped what I believe to be the role of women in society, um, and so um, that um, was an inherent bias in doing my research. Um, also. Um, one thing that I wanted to talk about was that because I am not a self-identified woman, a practicing Muslim, um, I am not a mother, and or from Iranian descent and culture, I cannot um, cannot relate to the experiences that these women currently endure or are enduring. But in fact, I am simply just going to do my best to interpret and share these experiences of my research. But I wanted to make one thing clear, that I'm not speaking on behalf of these women. I'm just simply, again, sharing their experiences and what they endure. So my methodology, so I looked at books and work, um, various works by scholars in the field. Um, and when I was looking at these particular works and um, periodic, uh, periodic articles, uh, journals, etc., cetera, um, one thing really came up for me, and as well as in class, was the need to define what a revolution is. There's a lot of different um, theories of what, how to define a revolution, so I really need to create my own definition based on um, previous work on it, and as well as investigating the current status of women um, in Iran. Um, so um, some issues that resulted in kind of my methodology was one, translations of text. I don't speak Farsi, so that was kind of a difficult uh, thing to do to um, find well um, translated documents, especially for the family protection law and the Islamic constitution, but um, was able to find some of it. How accurate that is, I'm 
still not sure, um, selection bias. So I picked left-leaning um, um, liberal activists in Iranian society during the revolution. I strayed away from conservative women. Um, and then also I made some general assumption that I was not able to interview every woman um, that was part of the Iranian revolution or their role. So I had to make some general assumptions based on the research in which I conducted. So, the need to define what is a revolution. So I used two particular works. One of them is uh, uh, Jack Goldstone's and then James DeFranzo's um, books on their theories of revolution. So taking those concepts of how they both define revolution, I came up with my own definition, which I will, which gives the night, which I believe gives the 1970 Iran movement. Uh, instead of it being considered a movement, a revolution. And revolution is a movement that drastically intends or successfully alters the society's economic, political, or social institutions through nonviolent and violent civil disobedience. So in order to also gain an understanding of the 1979 Iranian revolution, it's critical that we know where Iran is, the geography, and the population. So uh, its official name is the Islamic Republic of Iran. The capital of Tehran is right here. Um, and then this is where it is in the global context. So some of its neighbors include Afghanistan, Iraq, uh, Turkmenistan. Oh, gosh, you can never say it properly, but anyway, uh, another neighbor. And then, um, so country language, of course, Persian or better known as Farsi. And then the dominant religious group is Muslims, particularly Shiite Muslims, um, compared to the, uh, some of its neighbors like Saudi Arabia, who have a majority of Sunni Muslims, which creates a conflict. So I wanted to, in order to kind of understand how the 1979 revolution impacts uh, women, it's, I, I believe it's kind of critical to understand um, the status of women prior to the actual 1979 revolution. So during the Pahlavi dynasty era, there are major advancements in women's rights and status uh, in Iran. Some of those included um, women got the right to vote during that time. Um, and we'll talk about that a little bit more during the Iranian um, White Revolution. So, um, in order for the Shah, which is pretty much the king um, during that time, um, how they were able to conduct modernization projects and social reforms, uh, what they ended up doing was disbanding parliament in 1961 to carry out these um, social reforms. And so, uh, this is kind of the first major strike that the Shah does to start to accept the general population within Iran. Um, one of the next uh, things that results is the Iranian White Revolution. So there are six major goals or social reforms that the um, Shah regime wants to implement uh, in Iranian society. And so um, one of those key areas is giving women the right to vote and improving the overall status of women's rights. And so, again, women getting the right to vote. One of the major key documents that comes out of this is the Family Protection Law, pretty much uh, allowing women to divorce their husbands, having them an equal chance of getting custody rights of their children, etc. Um, so as a result, um, laws like this start to come into effect. However, um, there is major opposition to reform and modernization. So a lot of Islamic leaders and scholars um, started to uh, go against the Shah regime and they're believing that these social reforms and modernization projects um, were against Islamic teachings and practices and so um, this is where we start to see the major um, ups, uptake in the, uh, what would lead to the revolution. So um, many, despite uh, the idea that uh, many women would support the Shah regime because they're getting all these rights, getting the right to vote, um, promoting equality, etc., uh, women still were opposed to the Shah regime. One of the reasons is they thought that the Shah regime and the government uh, treated women as sex objects, so they thought that they were a um, tool for the government to use, that um, again, the government was only promoting that um, so that they could use them as sex objects, so that becomes one of the major issues. Another major issue of why uh, uh, women in Iran were opposed to the Shah regime was U.S. intervention. They often thought that uh, U.S. intervention, um, that the Iranian government or the Shah regime uh, was an American puppet, and so they were simply carrying out the duties of the American government instead of the Iranian people. 
Um, another one was uh, the government's failure to acknowledge or practice Islamic faith and traditions. So a lot of, um, of those Islamic faith and traditions were kind of put to the side. This is again another reason why Islamic leaders and scholars were so upset um, with the Shah regime. Um, and then finally, Ayatollah uh, Khomeini, which is uh, the, leading, the leader of the revolution, pretty much. Um, and a lot of reason, a lot of reasons why the, uh, the women population in Iran were so supportive of this was because Homi was a very uh, charismatic leader. He was able to convince the masses, um, and of course, with every revolution, there is often a leader who is able to do so. And so uh, he takes that leadership role um, in the revolution. So. Really the issues and events of the Iranian Revolution. So the key idea here that I want to stress is that this revolution was a conservative Islamic revolution. Very few of its kind um, up until this point actually ever did happen or were successful. This is probably the first, um, as far as I know, conservative Islamic revolution um, that happened. And um, really this is a key moment in history because most of the times it would be a, um, a liberal type of revolution. So really wanted to stress the idea that it's a conservative Islamic revolution. Um, as mentioned earlier, Rahola Khomeini, or Atoa Khomeini, um, um, was the leader of the event, so often would um, tape his um, various teachings uh, and would spread those out throughout Iran, um, would often criticize the Shah regime for its lack of uh, adhering to Islamic practices, um, Khomeini was an imam, which is a religious scholar uh, in the Islamic faith, and so particularly in the Shia sect, and so um, he becomes a critical issue. So why there was a lot of anti-Shah protests and mounting opposition? Well, one of the first initial um, events that happens is the Black Friday Massacre. Uh, so on September 8th, um, at exactly 8 a.m., um, the military comes in, um, there are protests in the Tehran Square, and as a result, um, the government fires, killing 68 people. Um, and this, this increases the amount of pressure. Uh, a lot of um, revolutionaries started to, um, the amount of protests pretty much increased from that point on. Um, also, economic conditions. Um, because of American influence, which we'll talk about a little bit later, um, some of the economic conditions in Iran at that time uh, started to worsen, and as a result, um, more people thought that the uh, government needed to take more responsibility in improving the economy. The Shah regime did think so, that they thought they were doing an excellent job, so they did not um, listen to the opposition forces. Also, um, again, as mentioned several times, un-Islamic practices by the Shah regime. Um, so again, many citizens in Iran thought the Shah was just simply un-Islamic and didn't respect Islamic teachings. Um, and so that becomes a bigger issue. And again, uh, foreign influence, particularly American intervention um, and Western intervention um, in Iran would become the final piece uh, to the revolution and why the population revolts. So the revolution, of course, occurs. And so some of the things that kind of happen as post Revolution was is Iranian Islamic motherhood and family dynamics start to change. So first of all, the mar um, marriages of women, and so women of the age was increased during the Shah regime about what age uh, young girls and women could get married. Um, that age is decreased to the age of 13. However, you could go even lower than that. Uh, judges can de determine that uh, a young girl was eligible for marriage if her um, physical uh, capabilities um, were fully developed, and so um, that would also deem her ready for marriage. Um, also, the repeal of the family protection law. So as a result of that, um, women now are, are not equal in uh, the relationship between men and women um, in marriage, and um, so often the men is pretty much, again, uh, prior to the Shah regime is in control of the women, and in a sense, women are property. Um, by the reversal of the family protection law. Also with family, um, in the event um, men had all control of finances, etc. Um, so that becomes another big issue for women. Um, so when women did try to divorce their husbands, which was allowable under certain circumstances, 
um, women often were not given the right to have their children um, or even given the right to at least fight for custody for children. Um, and that becomes a really big um, issue um, as well as um, oftentimes is with land inheritance. Uh, so women, um, if for example, if their father died or if, uh, their husband died um, and they had land or property, oftentimes the woman was not able to inherit that land. Um, and so that becomes a major contention point. And so if, even if women were to divorce their husband, uh, they weren't able to have um, any land. Oftentimes they were only um, given some penance or some very few funds from the selling of the property, but weren't actually allowed to hold property um, themselves. So education and employment were also uh, dramatically impacted um, by the Iranian Revolution. So um, one of the big things that um, happened was women, um, the Islamic leaders, uh, Homini in particular, thought that women were the transmitter, transmitters of knowledge and of Islamic teachings and practices. So uh, he, uh, he instructed uh, schools and especially higher education institutions to kind of reshape um, how educational policies and practices uh, and teachings were carried out in schools. So the government, um, the revolutionary government actually shut down uh, schools um, and higher education institutions to restructure um, the teaching so that a woman could get the proper knowledge in order to best um, help their young children and their families adhere to Islamic practices and faiths. Um, so as well as, um, again, as mentioned, Islamic teachings and education, both boys and girls did receive Islamic teachings, but women a lot more um, relig religious teachings because, again, they are these transmitters of knowledge. Um, one thing that the uh, revolutionary government also did is it disbanded co-educational schools, so boys and girls were not allowed to go to um, the same primary or even secondary or higher education institutions together in their classes, so boys had one set of practices of learning, preparing them for careers and fields, while women's uh, teachings mostly revolved around home life, uh, domestic structures, and of course, religious teachings. Um, also, it's uh, key to note at this time that um, prior to the revolution, during the Shah regime, the Shah regime actually dis um, um, disallowed women from wearing the hijab in public. And so, um, one of the things that the revolutionary government does is it, um, makes all girls start to wear the hijab um, back in um, public life, including school. Um, also, women in higher education, I thought that was a key important to hit since, of course, we are in a higher education institution, um, and many of um, my fellow peers um, can relate on this note that um, women in higher education, uh, higher education starts to uh, shift. So prior to the revolution, uh, women were allowed to explore different fields such as doctors, nurses, any field, pretty much even law. Um, and after the revolution, uh, the revolutionary government starts to clamp down um, on that. And um, not allowing, they, women had to pursue fields and careers that would not um, hinder them from carrying out their motherly activities. Um, and that's whatever the government defined it as motherly. And so whether that was watching the children when they got out of school, whether that was cooking, etc., it was really at the government's hand in determining uh, what fields uh, women were allowed to pursue. Uh, most of the time, it was even more restrictive than that, and women weren't even allowed to attend higher education institutions or were discriminated against in the admissions policy part of um, applying to higher education institutions. And then, um, again, lack of career options because of motherhood. So some female activists and leaders um, that are really key to understanding the revolution. Um, so um, the first one is Dr. Faku Parse, and, uh, and she was a, um, sorry, jumped ahead in my notes a little bit. Um, so she was a um, key player in the revolution because um, she was elected the first uh, female member of the Majils, which um, pretty much is the uh, Iranian parliament. Um, and as a result, um, she becomes a leading figure in that. However, 
um, and she was also a big advocate and activist for women's rights in Iran. Um, and she becomes a major player. Uh, but unfortunately, after the revolution, uh, she um, would be disbanded. Uh, she'd be removed and eventually killed because she would still protest against the um, revolutionary government. Um, some other women include uh, Farku Parsar and Ma Mananz Afkhami, um, and then Shireen Ibadi, which is right, this is her picture right here. And I actually read her autobiography, and she talks about women's roles in the Iranian Revolution. And so here are my um, citations and sources that I use um, for my particular um, research. But um, one thing, again, I just really wanted to stress that women in today's world are still constantly overlooked, ignored, oppressed, and have not yet achieved equality in the world. Uh, often scholars still uh, do not investigate the role of women in, Iran, uh, in revolution, and that is hopefully as time continues, more scholars start to investigate the role of women, because as we can see um, in the 1979 Iranian revolution, um, women are greatly impacted as a result of the revolution and played a key role into opposing former governments. Thank you. Any questions? Were women able to leave Iran at the, after the um, revolution or were like borders closed? Or? I mean, there were still open borders, but again, most women who were in um, already um, relationships with another man, often the man restricted that, so if the woman did try to escape the marriage, often the government uh, either uh, jailed the women or they were killed by their spouses. It sounds like you've read some stuff that sort of bring us from 1979 up to the present. What would be your assessment on the state of uh, women since the revolution, or is has it evolved at all, or it stayed relatively constant throughout? Yeah, I, I would say for the most part uh, it has started to evolve. Um, the, the Iranian government has become a little bit less restrictive on certain Islamic practices. However, um, still in my personal view, uh, and what I've researched is that many women still face discrimination because the, um, the constitution that results after the 1970 revolution is still currently in place in Iran, which still has all those restrictive measures against Uh, how would you say that this Iranian revolution might have impacted feminist theory today? Can you repeat that one more time? Sorry. How would you say that uh, the Iranian revolution has impacted feminist theory today? I mean, I definitely think that in regards to feminist theory, I think it definitely um, gives a different aspect of that um, because it was a conservative Islamic revolution and women play um, what we typically view um, as a uh, woman's role in a revolution, um, we start to kind of those dynamics kind of change. However, we could still see um, that women again are often overlooked and they're still being oppressed and not yet, not yet have achieved equality um, in various places around. Do you see any echoes of, um, from your research, do you see any um, echoes of this in our current politics in our own country? Oh, I, I definitely think uh, that's uh, really present, especially um, that our um, current president had said, uh, uh, grab women by their pussy and stuff like that, comments like that, um, as well as various supporters. Um, I would say that even on both sides, um, sexual exploitation of women, especially in Hollywood, is still relevant. Um, however, particularly, I think um, there's even a, another line in which Islamic women face higher rates of discrimination within U.S. society because they wear the hijab. Often you hear comments like, go back to your own country, etc. So I think that that still plays a major impact, and I think the current presidency and politics have enabled uh, that, those atta attacks like those to continue and get worse.